What's up, everybody, and welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explain, we're looking at Speak No Evil, where we follow a Danish family visiting a Dutch family that they met on holiday. What was supposed to be an idyllic weekend slowly starts unraveling as the Danes try to stay polite in the face of unpleasantness. Politeness and social niceties are certainly at the forefront of Speak No Evil, and much of its runtime plays like a dark comedy of manners. That is until late in the runtime when things go full thriller, leading to a shockingly violent conclusion. It is interesting watching how this plays out with our story, as our Danish couple is pushed further and further past normal social boundaries. At what point do you finally say you've had enough? It made me really put myself in the character's shoes. How would I react in a similar situation? Well, I certainly wouldn't have put up with as much as Bjorn was willing to, that's for sure. As things wear on and the couple are tested to the limits of what you'd accept, it almost becomes absurd. Like, no one would just let all this happen without saying something. That sort of adds to the strange comedic layer of the movie, because things are always just a little off and icky. This honestly becomes frustrating by the end. You're going, why aren't you doing anything? Stand up for yourself! The first time I watched this, I was actually genuinely pissed at how things play out, but I couldn't get the movie out of my head. The more that I thought about it, I realized that's the whole point. It's to make us shout at the screen and go, what are you doing? This is all by design, to again really make us think how we would react if we were in Bjorn and Luisa's shoes. So let's check out Speak No Evil, breaking down the story, its important themes explored, as well as explaining the meaning behind the shocking and, well, infuriating ending. Headlights break through the darkness, driving unsteadily down a backwoods road. There's a light up ahead, and a family silently gathers their things along with a child in the back seat. Even though nothing out of the ordinary happens, the feel of this opening is quite foreboding. In the daytime, the resort is much more pleasant, with a nice pool and view and everything. A vacationing couple, Bjorn and Luisa, along with their daughter Agnes, are enjoying the water. Some random guy, Patrick, approaches, asking if his chair is free. Bjorn doesn't look exactly thrilled, but tells him it's fine, moving his stuff out of the way. Before heading out for the evening, they leave Agnes with a babysitter, making sure she doesn't give her any apple juice. It's too much sugar. On the way to dinner, Bjorn complains of another couple, always going on about their cooking classes, and today is no different, the guy droning on about ravioli, and Bjorn listens looking dead-eyed. Patrick addresses the crowd, apologizing for their late-night arrival, as we saw in the opening scene. He acknowledges that he doesn't know anyone here, but that is the way that it goes on holidays. He really wants to get to know all of them, as they all look so nice and beautiful. He finishes up with a toast to Italy, food, and love. Uh, yeah, what else do you need? After dinner, the group take in a singing show. Louise snaps some photos, while Bjorn looks actually moved by the performance. There does seem to be something going on with him, as later that night, the rest of the family is fast asleep, but he is wide awake. He gets up, staring listlessly into the night, hearing a symphony of crickets. He notices someone else standing outside in the shadows, but when looking back, they're gone. The next day in town, they're trying to find somewhere to eat, but another issue presents itself. Agnes lost her bunny plush somewhere along the way. Bjorn grumbles to himself in annoyance, but sets out into the streets to find her missing stuffy. After scouring around the rustic city, he finally finds the bunny on a wall overlooking a picturesque view. Bjorn returns triumphant, finding that the couple Patrick and Karen have bumped into his family. They ask their boy's name, but he stays strangely silent. They excuse that he has difficulty speaking when under pressure, and his name is Abel. They explain about the whole rabbit thing, and Patrick is impressed, calling what he did quite heroic. Bjorn laughs it off, but he clarifies he is being serious here. Since they haven't eaten yet, the families all dine together, looking like a real friendship might be burgeoning here. They discuss that Patrick lives out in the country, and Louisa gushes that she always wanted to live somewhere out in nature. Based on her order, he assumes that she is vegetarian. Louisa does eat some fish, but that's it meat-wise. Patrick again compliments her. That's so good, and good for the environment. Bjorn relates that as they are respectively Dutch and Danish, that they are quite similar. They have the same culture and sense of humor. As for work, Patrick says that he's a doctor, impressing the others. They reunite with the others at the hotel for more food and wine, and the couples are definitely getting more comfortable together. Though naturally, all vacations must come to an end, and the family return back home to the city. Bjorn checks the mail, and they have a postcard from Patrick and Karen. They say that they have been thinking of all the fun they had during the summer, and invite them to stay out at their place in the Dutch countryside. Oh, and Abel has been talking non-stop about Agnes. He just can't wait to see her again. They agree that it's a nice gesture, but Louisa is unsure of spending time with people they barely know. Bjorn, on the other hand, seems to be longing for something different, going back to staring out the window. It really feels like he is just going through the motions here, kind of dead inside. At Agnes' school performance, he stares sullenly at the floor until it's time to applaud at the conclusion. They have dinner with another couple, and the topic turns to their invitation. They're unsure if they should go, Louisa complaining they've already done so much flying this year. The other guy suggests they can just drive it. It's only about eight hours away. Bjorn perks up at this. That's nothing. They could do it all overnight. Woo! There's also the consideration that it might be rude to decline. Well, can't have that. They did have fun with him after all, 
Well, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, they laugh. When doing the dishes, the environment feels sinister again, focusing in on a photo of the families together during their trip. So they make their way out to their nice looking house nestled amongst the trees. Karen runs out excited to see them. They're given a warm welcome to the house and Louisa compliments just how comfortable it is here. They brought their hosts a few gifts, which they give a weirdly half-hearted appreciation to. They're taken on a tour and when seeing a little makeshift bed for Agnes in Abel's room, the girl looks a bit perturbed, but her mother smiles. They'll figure it out. Patrick has been hard at work in the kitchen on a massive slab of wild boar all day. He offers a piece to Louisa in spite of her being vegetarian. He kind of gently pressures her repeatedly to try some. She finally relents and takes a bite. It's good, she offers. Already Patrick and Karen are pushing their social boundaries. Bjorn goes to take out the trash and spots another little shack nearby on the grounds. He peers in the windows but can't make out much inside. He gets startled by Abel appearing. They stare awkwardly at each other and the boy opens his mouth wide revealing that he has no tongue. There's a knock at the window and the boy runs off. Bjorn and Patrick get into a conversation about the ubiquity of technology, which Patrick finds frightening. The idea of handing all of our control and responsibility to technology. Bjorn agrees. People nowadays can't even read a map. Even sometimes when driving modern cars, wishes there was just some kind of way to turn it all off. They inquire about the boy's missing tongue and Patrick informs him it's totally fine. Just a case of congenital aglosia. Basically, he was born without a tongue or one much smaller than the average. He's not in pain at all, but it does prove difficult when trying to express himself. That night, Agnes is unable to deal with her tiny bed and hops in with her parents. Her mom takes her in her arms, cooing that nothing bad will ever happen to her as long as she's around. Bjorn is excited, telling them to settle in for a great weekend. They go off on a nice walk in a massive field and spend some time at an old windmill. Yet the undercurrent of strangers really starts bubbling to the surface here. Agnes wants to go down the slide, but Abel won't get out of the way for some reason. She gets her mom to try, but the boy still doesn't budge. So Patrick takes it to the next level. He sternly walks over and grabs the boy by the collar, yanking him away. Bjorn tries to downplay it all as no big deal, but Patrick doesn't back down and forces the boy to apologize. Agnes does finally get to slide down the slide, and I'm sure it was totally worth it. Look at that thing. <laughs> Wee. After that, Louisa isn't feeling comfortable here anymore, finding the couple unpleasant. Before they can discuss things further, Karen comes in inviting them to dinner. She tantalizes them with a nice place with great local food just up the road. You don't want to miss this opportunity, and the couple keep their paces smiles on. Bjorn is incensed. Oh, see how terrible they are? And come on, there's only a day and a half left. About to leave, there's some confusion, as according to Karen, it's an adults-only excursion. But don't worry, my good friend is here to be the babysitter. Sure, you don't know anything about this guy, but don't want to be Rude, right? Karen touts that all the kids love him and the whole neighborhood uses him. You can't refuse. Plus, Patrick honking in the car and yelling them to hurry it up doesn't help things either. They drive for quite some time, long enough for them to grow concerned about how long they've been on the road. They do make it to the less than impressive establishment without incident, but Bjorn and Louisa are unable to read the menu, so they entrust Patrick to order in their stead, and Louisa reminds him that she's vegetarian. He feigns confusion at the mention and then repeats his earlier sentiment. Oh yeah, so good for the environment. But he can't help but poke at her a little bit. You do eat fish though, so you're technically pescatarian. Are you saying fish isn't meat? Of course it is, she responds, but it is better for the environment, she maintains. Patrick keeps on her. So the way the fishing industry works and how the ocean is treated, that has no effect on the climate. She can't help but laugh it off and Bjorn toes to good times. Man, that guy is kind of a dick, huh? And we're seeing more and more of that darker sensibility of his coming out to play. After a few more drinks, things start getting real loosey-goosey in the empty joint. Patrick drags his wife over to dance and Bjorn and Karen watch on, almost appearing jealous. Like, is that what normal couples are supposed to be like? They join the other couple on the dance floor, stiffly moving back and forth. Their pals step it up a notch, launching into a messy makeout session. This naturally makes Bjorn and Louisa uncomfortable once more. I mean, a kiss is one thing, you know, but that's just sloppy, even if the place is empty. When it's time to pay the bill, Bjorn's nicest is given another test from Patrick. He notes how big the bill is, and Bjorn offers to chip in. Patrick hands in the bill, as in the whole bill. Bjorn asks in confusion, dinner is on us? Patrick pounces immediately on this, thanking him with a pat on the arm. Still nothing too nefarious, but it's obvious that Bjorn has no limit to his niceness, or perhaps even his meekness is the problem here. It doesn't help matters on the drive home, as Patrick drunkenly swerves around the road and blasts music to Louise's annoyance. She does at least get him to turn it down, barking to turn the fucking music down. Karen laughs and apologizes for him being drunk. He too says sorry, only to crank the music back up again. She has to demand that he turn it down once more, which he does, but continues swerving all over the road dangerously, even nearly careening right into a tree. Luckily, at least when they return home, the kids are both fine and fast to sleep to Louisa's relief. I mean, 
who knows, it was left in the care of a stranger. That feeling won't last long, however. She goes to take a shower, and after a few minutes, Patrick strolls in and brushes his teeth in silence. Louisa appears baffled as well as violated. He doesn't do anything actually, but does linger right outside the door for a few moments before stomping off. Man really starting to overstep those boundaries. In bed, she doesn't reveal what happened, and they soon start getting frisky. Their bone business is interrupted by shouting for Magnus. She wants to sleep with him. The couple choose to ignore her pleas and continue the lovemaking. And to really push that boundary even further, Patrick is actually watching them together through the window. Good lord, dude. Louisa wakes up later to check on the kids and finds Agnes is not in her bed. She's in bed with the couple, including a naked Karen. Well, that's weird. This is the end of the line for Louisa, who rouses Bjorn to get out of here now. They hurriedly get their stuff together and slink out in the early morning, with little Abel watching on from the window. They get a pretty good ways away until a familiar problem rears its head. Nenus, the rabbit, is missing. She must have left it back at the house. Bjorn pulls over to check the luggage, and there's no sign of the bun bun. Louis tries to calm her down. We could just buy you another one. Agnes whines that she wants that one, and her mom gets real. It's gone. You've got to get over it. She gets even more upset, and mom comforts her. I miss him, she cries. I know, but he lives with Abel now. He'll have a great time. Bjorn is looking like his out of sorts demeanor again, and they decide to turn around. No, don't do it. You were so close. The bunny isn't worth it. It isn't worth it. Also worth pointing out that Louisa was fine with letting Agnes be disappointed, while Bjorn refuses to do this no matter what. Huge mistake. They get back to the house, and Bjorn goes inside to hopefully quickly get the rabbit. Unfortunately, it was all a mistake, as Agnes finds Nina's down in the floorboards. Oh boy. Louisa follows after to retrieve her husband, quietly sneaking around the still quiet house. She hears someone talking upstairs, and it's Bjorn chatting with Patrick. He tries to say they've had some lovely days here, and Patrick is incensed. We've got a problem here. Someone left without saying goodbye. Patrick wants to know why exactly they're leaving, and Bjorn stammers that there were just some things. It's best if we go home. Patrick pushes him in his usual fashion, demanding to know specific examples. You were watching us have sex. That's reason enough. Leave. Get out of there now. You know, but he won't do it. He mutters weakly that the bed is small and Agnes doesn't want to sleep on the floor. Louisa steps up with her own grievances, telling him that she means no disrespect first, but as we know, she's vegetarian and all he's been serving the whole time they've been here is meat. And the drive at the restaurant was very uncomfortable. Not just the loud music, but the dangerous drinking and driving. Plus the way they were all over each other made them feel uncomfortable too. Patrick looks genuinely upset at the accusations, even admitting that he's in shock. It's up to his wife to assuage their concerns. First off, sorry, but if you're vegetarian, you could have told us what you don't want to eat right, or you know, just don't eat it even if someone insists. And she's also sorry that their house isn't huge, so they don't have any big luxury rooms to offer them. And as for Agnes, she thought it was only natural to have the kids bunk together. Then at the roadhouse, they were just having a fun evening. And what's so bad about dancing and kissing with the one you love? Well, those are all quite reasonable defenses to be fair. Although there is another thing that Louisa will not accept, taking her daughter to their bed and sleeping with her in the nude. Karen turns this on her. Well, where were you, Louisa? And she really lays it on thick. Agnes kept calling and was crying. Patrick knows that they can't change how they felt, but it breaks his heart that they haven't enjoyed their stay. He feels as though he's failed as a host. And well, no one is forcing them to stay, but he teases them that if they do, today is gonna be a great day. The couple eye each other like, are we really gonna do this? Yep. Louisa chips in on some yard work and Karen complains that the scissors are too dull. They don't cut anything. Meanwhile, the boys quickly bond with Patrick exposing him to some good old Dutch music. He sings along, calling this what angels sound like. Bjorn eyes him and can't help but smile. His energy is so infectious. At a quarry of some kind, Patrick apologizes again for making him feel uncomfortable. He divulges that he has this thing in his heart, something powerful and wild, and it's bloodlust. He likes it. He really likes it. He asks if Bjorn understands, and he actually says that he does. Normally, he tries to hold it down or keep it in chains. Why? Patrick asks. He sighs that he doesn't know, blaming there being just too many rules. His life has become claustrophobic, and even feels that he has become someone that he doesn't want to be. Who is that guy? Just some normal guy who gets up in the morning and takes his daughter to school and starts getting really emotional. He has dinner with people he doesn't like, plays squash once a week, and cries that he is tired of smiling all the time. Patrick takes him to another area, a huge dune, and he lets out a guttural scream straight from the soul. He suggests Bjorn to give it a try too, and he really lets everything out. Finally letting himself do this has a profound effect on Bjorn, and he says that he's feeling good. Back at home, they're practically newly minted best buds after their bonding scream sesh. Things do seem much more friendly and comfortable than before, but it's not long until things get tense again. The kids want to show off a dance and are told they can do so after lunch. Karen asks Agnes to set the table and Louisa translates to her to show off how good she is. Kind of weird that she's asking her kid to do things, pretending to be her mom. While prepping, Louisa cuts her finger and Bjorn smirks. Good thing they have a doctor in the house. Patrick looks befuddled. I'm not a doctor. They're all, uh, you said you were? Karen chimes in that that was just a little white lie as Patrick gets insecure around new people. He just wants to make a good impression. So far, so good, guy. They wonder, well, then what do you do? And he says that he doesn't work 
work at all. He never has and doesn't even believe in it. Huh, well that's definitely weird too. Patrick then goes on a tirade about Dutch cheese being underappreciated and Karen keeps playing mother to Agnes. Louisa grows frustrated and growls for her to stop telling her what to do. Karen apologizes, asking her to relax and Patrick loads her up with a lot more wine. Yeah, that'll probably help. It's time for the main event, the kids dance show. It's not exactly earth shattering as expected, but little Abel is especially having trouble doing much of anything beyond flailing his limbs around. Boy's got no rhythm. This is a real problem for Patrick, who stops the music and scolds the boy for his moves. He turns it back on and Abel isn't getting it. He stops it again to yell at the boy. Bjorn steps in, offering that they're both quite good. I mean, they are just kids for goodness sakes. Patrick argues if he wants to reach his true potential, he must concentrate better. Okay, one more time. It's not any better. And this time Patrick is right up in the boy's face. He takes his legs, forcing him through the routine. And the tone changes completely in the room. Agnes doesn't want to dance anymore. Patrick is adamant she does. It has to be a duet. And Bjorn convinces her to give it one more shot. Patrick watches on calmly, taking a sip of his drink, only to get frustrated and launch the mug at the boy. Agnes runs to her mom and the boy is left weakly sobbing on his own. Bjorn puts a stop to this, turning off the song himself. Patrick doesn't understand what's the problem. Bjorn finally expresses himself, wondering what the hell is wrong with him? He's just a child. Louisa agrees that he is pretty effed up and Karen is offended. Oh, just because they do things a little differently? Uh, no, that's called child abuse, not the same thing. Louisa disagrees. It's about doing what's right, like showing your son love when he's crying instead of shouting at him. Why can't you just let him dance? Patrick scoffs, that wasn't dancing, and continues berating Abel. Louisa can't stand it anymore, excusing herself outside. She is quite emotional, and even snaps at Agnes to leave her alone. Bjorn ushers her away, and it's because she doesn't want Agnes to see her like this. This is also strange, it's like showing any kind of real emotion is frowned upon in the family, or even just the possibility of Louisa appearing weak in some way. With their impending departure in the morning, Bjorn is already being sucked back into his mundane existence. There's discussion of Agnes's flute lesson on Tuesday, which he has entirely by himself. The others are way too shaken up, and he declares ultimately, yep, I'll take her to the lesson. They don't care. He too gets to have a fun little encounter with Patrick in the bathroom. While brushing his teeth, his host enters and takes a whiz right behind him, the two in uncomfortable silence. Patrick then turns, looking at him in the mirror. Again, Bjorn says nothing, not even like, uh, excuse me, or whatever. It's important to reiterate how much of a polite pushover this guy really is, especially considering what happens next, thrusting our story into a much more terrifying situation. He's having trouble sleeping again, lost in his thoughts as usual. He hears what sounds like Patrick fighting with Abel through the walls and has to see what the ruckus is about. In the living room, he spots Patrick smoking outside. He looks over to that other little house, seeing the door repeatedly swinging. When passing by the fridge, we notice they had the same photo from their own home. He slinks to the other building, uncovering a treasure trove of alarming evidence. There's cameras and several bags of luggage, obviously belonging to previous victims of Patrick's clan. In the next room, it's covered in family photos, and based on the number on display, they have killed a lot of people. Each picture bears a striking similarity, but it also establishes a frightening pattern. In one photo in particular, we see Karen and Patrick with another kid, and the other family they're with is Abel's actual parents, seeing as a tongue and everything. In the follow-up picture, Abel is now in Patrick's clutches, seen looking down and defeated. And that wouldn't make sense if they killed his parents. This is all obviously a huge bombshell. Up until now, sure, they've crossed the line in many ways when it comes to polite society, but certainly murdering people and taking their kids is a whole other level of messed up. He moves on to another building and is shocked to his core by what he sees. It's Abel lying drowned in the pool. Yep, the cycle continues, and it sounds like they have their newest bundle of joy all picked out. Bjorn does have the appropriate reaction this time, quickly rounding up his family to get out of there post haste. As they pull away, the light clicks on upstairs, meaning the murderers are aware of their fleeing in the night. With tears in his eyes, they speed down the road. Bjorn is quite paranoid, and there is palpable fear when another car pulls up beside them. But thankfully, it continues on. After refueling, they come to another car on the side of the road. As soon as they pass, its lights click on and starts to follow them. He makes a quick and foolish decision to drive right off the road, and the other car drives past. The uneven train wakes up the girls, and before long, he hits a bump and gets stuck. Naturally, they have no cell signal, and Bjorn sets out to survey the area. There's some lights off nearby in the distance. He informs the girls that he's going to go there and ask for help. Make sure to lock the doors. Not too far off, we see that Patrick is there watching. Bjorn sprints for the house while Patrick descends upon the car. He has to cross a moat of some kind and scales a fence, calling for anybody around. He tries the door and keeps screaming, but looks like nobody's home. Even worse, by the time he makes it back to the car, his family is already gone. He runs off into the fog, hoping to find them.
them. Clutching his daughter's precious bunny, he begins to cry. Lights crest the road behind him, and it stops a few feet away. Uh-oh. Patrick casually tells him hello, Bjorn looking absolutely terrified. Patrick is still holding up the innocent facade for some reason, and thanks him for the call. It was your idea to meet us up the road. This is another important moment for Bjorn. Presumably, he hasn't told Louisa that they are in the presence of actual killers, and she even expresses gratitude to Karen for coming to help them out. Patrick approaches, telling Bjorn to get in the car. He spittles in fear and begs him to not hurt them. Patrick tells him to relax. As long as you do what we want, everything's gonna be fine. Would you have any reason to trust this guy at this point? It's like a negative 100%, you know what I mean? And he doesn't have a gun or a knife or anything. He's literally just asking him to get in the car. However, we know Bjorn well enough at this point that he does do as ordered, as frustrating as it might be. The charade continues with Louisa asking about Abel. Is he asleep at home? Oh no, the babysitter is with him. When, of course, we know he's dead. She checks in on her husband and he grumbles that he's okay. In the most maddening example of Bjorn's cowardice, and also showing off Patrick's macho control over them, he pulls over to take a piss. Now, he leaves the keys in the car and everything. The others all just sit there and watch and wait. I'm like, uh, make a break for it, you fools! But that's the whole tragic point here. He truly can't do anything. The ride continues, and they start asking questions. We are going back to your house, right? Yeah, I'm sure. The couple only shushes them and tells them to be quiet. No, they are not going to the house. Agnes is really frightened now, and her mother repeats her mantra. As long as I'm here, nothing bad will happen to you. Karen watches over the scene with a detached amusement. Louisa asks again what's going on, and Patrick growls for her to shut the fuck up. Bjorn tries to man up way too late, telling him don't talk to my family like that. A simple headbutt knocks him back into submission. Louisa finds the door is locked, bringing Agnes closer. Karen starts talking to the girl, and then asks Louisa to let her go. Bjorn does a seat belt only to get socked in the stomach. Karen pulls out her garden scissors. You will let her go, she coos. The babysitter guy appears and rips open the door, putting Louisa in a chokehold. Bjorn feebly punches at Patrick and gets easily pummeled into oblivion. They hold Louisa tighter, and Karen cuts out Agnes's tongue. Bjorn pukes, and the girl is bleeding profusely. The guy carries her away, and they drive off, Louisa pounding at the glass and screaming for her daughter. They're driven back to a familiar location, the quarry where Patrick and Bjorn barned it earlier. Now given a twisted new layer as it becomes the site of their grisly death. They open the doors for the couple, who march out with the energy of people who know their time is short. Bjorn wants to know why they are doing this. Because you let us, Patrick flatly replies, which is kind of the crux of the entire movie. Time and time again, they're pushing and pushing those societal boundaries, and every time they let politeness win out. Now that that's been pushed to the most extreme limits imaginable, again, they probably know they're gonna die, but make no attempt to fight for their lives whatsoever. Again, they don't have a weapon or anything, you know? It's literally just because, as Patrick says, because they let him. Kind of fucked up. They're ordered to strip and sent down into a valley in the rocks. They take each other in their trembling arms. I'm sorry, Bjorn sobs. Karen and Patrick launch a barrage of rocks upon them, and they still do nothing, letting themselves die, essentially, in a quite painful way. Patrick grabs an extra large rock and launches it, landing right on Bjorn's head. The deed done, Karen warmly leans into her bow, and he gives her a tender kiss on the head. Morning comes, seeing the couple's lifeless bodies lying there amongst the rubble. We move on to the calming ripples of a resort pool. There's tons of families and little kids frolicking in the sprinklers, and there's another family scene with a young boy eating breakfast. They're all naively enjoying themselves, unaware of the threat headed their way. Patrick's car makes its way around windy roads approaching the resort. The couple are on their way to do their horrific game all over again, now joined by their latest faux child, Agnes, looking forlorn in the back seat, clutching her bunny. Pretty brutal ending. So what is the takeaway here? A lot of it ties back to Patrick's line about because you let me. Throughout the story, is constantly pushing Bjorn, especially, to see what he's really made of. Like when they're doing the scream thing, it sounds like there is a spark of some kind inside of Bjorn that has been extinguished by his mundane family life. Maybe he was at one point in his life more confident like Patrick. Yet what Patrick's sick game ultimately proves is that at his core, Bjorn is way too repressed to ever break out of his shell and man up, so to speak. There's a very obvious battle of masculinity going on here, with Patrick certainly giving off a much more traditional male energy, while on the other hand, Bjorn is consistently seen as weak and a pushover, not a man in that same antiquated sense. This isn't my opinion of any kind, it's just very obvious from the story that that's what the intention is here. As Bjorn was unable to ever conquer his fears or put himself and his family over being polite, this is what led to their tragic fates. On the other hand, I was really trying to understand what the heck is wrong with Karen and Patrick. They obviously get sick pleasure out of their murderous game and have gone through the same process several times beat for beat, taking the kid as their own, cutting their tongue out and everything. This also naturally reminds us of the title of the movie and those three old wise monkeys, representing see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. Of course, there are many interpretations of the proverb's meaning, but it's often used to refer to those who deal with impropriety by turning a blind eye. Basically, that means failing to observe standards regarding honesty, language, behavior, or character, but you choose to ignore undesirable information. That definitely fits
fits in overall with our story. As Bjorn does this time and time again, as more alarming events occur, he continuously refuses to accept what's happening, deciding to simply play along with his captors. So in a way, we are seeing this concept brought to brutal life, represented with the evil Patrick and meek Bjorn. If only he had been willing to confront this and really deal with the reality of the situation, things might have turned out a little differently. Yet this still doesn't quite illuminate the couple's purpose in their killing games. I thought at first maybe they couldn't get pregnant, so this is their sick way to steal children and have a faux family of their own. That could be the case, but the wrinkle to that is that they have that accomplice babysitter. This implies a bigger group working together beyond Patrick and Karen, which led me into a more ritualistic or even culty kind of vibes. There's only a hint at this, but interestingly, in the original unfilmed ending, this would have come into a lot clearer focus. Rather than just Bjorn and Louisa meeting their demises, we would have had 30 different people being taken out in various ways. Just as with the Dutch couple, all these people were various visitors of other locals. This really adds a lot more to this aspect of the movie and would have been quite a big final moment. Regardless, the ending as it is makes it more specifically about the couples and still works at getting the same basic point across. If someone's being a dick, call them out on it. Otherwise, you and your family are screwed. With that, we reach the conclusion of this evening explain for Speak No Evil. Don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you think of Speak No Evil and its ending? How would you have done things differently than Bjorn? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.